and then recording is in progress. Raise your virtual hand, and then uh, Santiago will give you the floor. A big thanks at this point to Santiago for being my technical support today and uh, helping me in the background with everything. I'm very happy uh, to welcome you all and to have such a great panel with me. So um, I'm very uh, much looking forward to our program. We will have first have a scientific background um, from Ilaria. So we will hear about the situation on novel green forest jobs currently in the pan-European region. Then we have three uh, presentations of people working already in the sector. So about their careers, about their decisions, about opportunities and challenges. And um, then we will have uh, the student's perspective on the topic because it is also interesting to learn what the next generation on, of uh, forestry students feel and um, emphasize on this uh, novel green forest jobs. We will then come into a discussion with our panelists and open the floor for questions and answers. Um, yeah, if there's any problems, you can always write in the chat. Um, Santiago will try to help you immediately, um, especially when it comes to technical problems. But uh, let me introduce now our first speaker. Um, her name is Ilaria. She has a master's degree in natural resources economics um, from the University of Rome and a PhD um, in, from the University of Padua, investigating the topic of the use of forests from human well-being and health and the connected opportunities for the forestry sector. So I think this is already a very novel here. Uh, she's now working for ET4, where she is a transversal figure dedicated to the research and practice of innovative methods to enhance the cultural ecosystem services of natural areas, focusing in particular on educational values, social aspects, inclusiveness, health, and well-being. Laria, the floor is yours to present the results from our Novel Green Forest Jobs. Which Novel Green Forest Jobs do exist at the moment? Um, what are the challenges and what might be the future of these jobs? So I mute myself and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Just one second. Thank you for the uh, introduction. I would not say anything, uh, anything more than that. Uh, just that maybe I'm. Uh, I will be speaking and we. I will be presenting uh, some result of uh, an expert consultation process that we uh, that we did this year on novel green forest jobs. And I'm uh, so I'm also presenting on behalf a, of a bigger team. Let's say. Uh, so um, uh, there is this uh, team uh, working group on uh, on green forest jobs and uh, especially the subgroup analysis. So uh, today I will be speaking um, a little bit about novel green forest jobs. So what kind of uh, novel jobs we we have in the panorama, uh, which are the perceived challenges and also uh, future uh, perspective. Uh, so to do that, maybe um, is worth to give you a little bit of uh, introduction on green forest jobs in general. So I hope this can be uh, also useful as a framework for what we will hear uh, later on from the other guests. Uh, so as you may know, uh, the concept of green uh, jobs actually originates from the green economy concepts in the late uh, 80s and from the concept, concept of G, uh, green and just uh, transition. Uh, we have the very first definition that was given by the UNEP in 2008. Um, and this definition is speaking about all the type of jobs, so agriculture, manufacturing, uh, administrative services, uh, activities that contribute uh, substantially to preserve or restore environmental quality. After this definition, uh, we had uh, later on uh, a nice uh, addition, I would say, by uh, the International Labour Organization, uh, which uh, actually added the concept of uh, decency. So the green jobs must be decent, uh, must be, um, must be uh, productive, uh, provide adequate uh, income and social protection to the worker, uh, respect the rights of the worker and give them a say in decision that will affect their uh, lives and uh, situation. 
uh, from this, let's say, general um, uh, context, uh, Forest Europe also decided to uh, propose uh, a definition that was uh, that is, uh, let's say, um, uh, very specific for the forest uh, sector. Um, and this is the following. So green forest jobs provide forest related goods and services while meeting the requirement of sustainable forest management and decent work. So looking at the broader context uh, and uh, the data that, that we have, uh, forest sector employment overall has been decreasing in most of the European countries, um, around the 7%, 7 uh, around between the 2010 and 2020. Uh, it has been said that is mostly uh, for uh, mechanization and uh, technology. Uh, and also uh, because it's a little bit less attractive for, for young people. Um, nevertheless, what is considered traditional forestry jobs, so what we have in the data is mainly uh, the, um, yeah, the very traditional jobs, so forestry and logging, manufacturing of paper, wood, and furniture. Um, uh, but in the last decade, actually, we are witnessing uh, a widening of these typologies of job involved uh, in, the, in the forest sector. So in the specific here uh, on the right, uh, you have the seven thematic areas that are considered by uh, FAO and the European uh, Economic Commission as part of the, the green uh, uh, forest jobs. So you see the traditional topic, but they are surrounded by, for example, health and recreation, education, biodiversity and ecosystem functioning, and so on. So forest jobs are declining, uh, but if, we widen the look a little bit, green jobs are potentially growing also in non-traditional forest-related activities. So a shared understanding of the term of green forest jobs across the different countries so should also encompass jobs, you know, both from the traditional and the new forest-based sector. Um, in this, um, so if we need to look at the this new forest related sector and the novel and emerging job, um, uh, so because despite being uh, you know the, the the traditional sector, despite despite being considered very traditional and static, actually is uh, is moving, is facing uh, rapid changes and it's adapting to these changes. Um, and opportunities and drivers of this change are uh, are very uh, are really various. Uh, here you have listed just some of them, um, and they uh, might be the just transition and all the sector uh, around bioeconomy growing. Of course, technology and mechanization that can be a, a threat, uh, but also a very uh, a very big push to to changes. Digitalization. Uh, but also all consulting services. Uh, for example, I'm working just in consulting services uh, inside the, the forest uh, sector, but also environmental education and all the, uh, the services and, 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 and products um, that are more related to cultural system service provision. Um, so this, uh, so all these, uh, say, novelties that are generating from this change are often uh, unfortunately overlooked, and the jobs provided are rarely considered part of the uh, forest sector workforce. Nevertheless, the, um, the new forest-based sector has a great potential, let's say, to generate jobs and also mitigate the impact of decreasing employment. Therefore, we need to start recognizing and also considering novel green forest jobs uh, deriving uh, both from tradition and new forest-based sector. So to understand this potential of these novel green forest jobs, uh, we needed uh, actually to better understand um, which are these novel um, green forest jobs, uh, how do they look like, but also what are the, the main challenges that they are facing in this you know, emerging phase and which is likely to be their future. Uh, as mentioned already, um, this is a fast evolving, let's say niche and, and sector. Offer, uh, often um, it is uh, not captured in statistic and data also because these novel green forest jobs are not always easy to, to understand. Um, 
because they they also depend widely by cultural background and they different they may differ from country to country. Uh, so since there are few data and knowledge, we decided to do an exploratory work listing expert opinion to have um, qualitative data in order to start to shed a light uh, on these novel green forest jobs. So what uh, have we done? Let's say these here. We have uh, used two main um, uh, methodologies. So uh, we used a workshop that was held in October this year at the Forest uh, Europe Expert Group meeting where participants were asked to cluster the different uh, green forest jobs into a traditional, restorative, and novel job. Uh, also with the possibility to add novel green forest job uh, that they uh, experience in the, their countries. Uh, in this way, we wanted to capture the overall understanding, but also um, the situation in different countries and possible differences between countries. We also developed an online survey. The survey was looking in depth to describe single um, novel green forest jobs. Uh, we distributed it to, to experts um, around Europe, uh, and we had, um, I would say, a low response rate, but the answer are actually quite, um, quite rich. At the end, we have 14 uh, novel green forest jobs uh, that we further clustered. Uh, of course, we want to highlight that all the outputs are partial and subjective by nature, I would say, because they depend on expert knowledge. So uh, from the workshop, um, um, I would uh, just list these uh, uh, novel jobs that you see in the, in the table. So these novel jobs were the one indicated by most of the participants as uh, present in their country. So from the less present, to the more uh, common in the lower part. Um, these are the most uh, mentioned, and it's also interesting uh, noticing uh, that if we merge the food specialist, uh, food forest, and mushroom and truffle uh, specialist, the cluster on non-wood forest product is actually uh, quite, quite big. Uh, nevertheless, according to participant, uh, these, all these jobs provide still few jobs uh, in their country. And also a reflection came out um, that is not all countries are actually able to nurture green forest jobs, novel jobs, especially um, related to the lack of skilled workers and the digitalization. Um, for what uh, regard the survey, uh, so also your just few uh, results. Uh, we have uh, um, looked at uh, yeah, 16 uh, answers with 14 different jobs, and we clustered them in 11 categories. Uh, a first framework we can al analyze the uh, Green Novel jobs against is the contribution to ecosystem services. So we have clustered them in this way. You can read all the different categories, so specialized forest management, um, brought resistant forest management specialist. Um, so we have clustered them according to the contribution they give to ecosystem services. So um, enhancement of uh, regulating and supporting services, but also provision uh, with food, uh, especially food and also materials and enhancement of cultural ecosystem services. Uh, yeah. Level? yeah. Yeah, I will. Uh, another level is uh, to, to look at them against the uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, and actually also here, we can see that they are widening, uh, let's say the, uh, the set of uh, sustainable development goals they, they can uh, address. Um, also here, very quickly, uh, the novel uh, Green Forest Jobs Explored uh, represent um, an opportunity, especially for improving, um, uh, raising awareness on sustainable forest management, uh, and also as a diversification of the revenue for the uh, forest owners and managers. Uh, but also they, they represent um, a very nice opportunity, um, a job opportunity for young professional people outside forestry and also uh, women in the forest sector. Uh, concluding with uh, to the challenges, so uh, we asked the participant, the, the respondents about the main challenge it faced, and the answer are quite coherent among them. So the main problem is legislation and regulation that is absent 
or that can the, the, the existing one can prevent change. There is a lack of general recognition, but also of awareness. And um, sometimes there is a close mentality, so closeness uh, against this new uh, job and a uh, fundamental lack of uh, specialized training, especially uh, in a very uh, interdisciplinary way. So to conclude, uh, we have some needs that are easily inferable from the challenges. So we need recognition, so regulation and legis legislation. We also need more specialized trainings for upskilling and also for new profession. Uh, we will need also to monitor uh, the development with data uh, and we will see what we will see. So we will see new and wider synergies with other uh, non-forestry sectors, uh, but also uh, uh, yeah, work and jobs that will adapt to new working model, but especially um, a new um, a greater inclusion um, and, and diversity in terms of opportunities for vulnerable people, but also for people less involved until now in the sector. Um, and today, I think we have a great uh, examples here. Uh, so uh, thank you. Uh, and I'm looking forward to hear the stories of women that are at the, let's say, forefront of the change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ilaria, for presenting these results and for giving us inside information on how it looks at the moment for novel green forest jobs. I think this was very helpful also to actually understand what we mean with novel green forest jobs, because this is a new term since the whole topic is very new. And I am uh, very happy and excited now to um, directly hand over to our first speaker. Um, today we have here with us Eva from FSC, and she will present her us. So I'm not losing too many words on her biography because I think she will introduce herself um, in the best way. So please, Eva, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vera. Thank you very much. And just to check if you can see my screen, my PowerPoint. Yes, it's working perfectly. OK, perfect. Thank you. So thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really pleased to be here today. And uh, it's really a honor. So thanks for for to the Forest Europe team for for this invitation. My name is Eva Hermanovic. I'm a communications manager for Europe at the Forest Stewardship Council. And uh, as part of my job, it's uh, I tell stories, and this is why I have picked this title for my presentation. This is, I think, the novelty about. The job that I'm doing that I have the privilege to uh, travel around the world and tell stories of people who are connected to forests and who make a change on the ground and to tell their stories in an interesting way to the others so that their work and their impact on the ground is very well uh, perceived and explained. So today I would like to share my experience with you of how I got where I got and hopefully people who are here in the room um, will get some inspiration from that and uh, maybe it will help you uh, understand your own pathway a little bit better and choose your own pathway and address the dilemmas that maybe you are facing currently at the beginning of my career because this is what I also faced when I started this career about 20 years ago. So my key message for you here today is that any kind of talent you have can be useful for the forestry. You don't have to be a forester. Actually, when I studied, when I picked my um, university studies, I didn't even know that forestry existed, to be honest with you. So it means that really there are so many talents and so many skills that the world needs and that the forestry sector needs, that it's just about finding your talent and following your talent and building on it and then bringing it to the table, to this puzzle, to work together towards our common mission. 
And just a step back here about the six macro forces and themes currently in the world. I'm showing this Ipsos study here with you very briefly, just to, to show you that there are so many things, if you look at the world today, like in a macroscopic way, where forests actually fit somehow to address the challenges that are connected to those topics. For example, if we look at climate change, it's so obvious that forests need to play a role. If you look at here at the growing mental health crisis, it's so obvious that forests are a space um, and a place where we can look for calm and for finding ourselves in the forest. So if you look at it from the perspective, from the global perspective, then you apply a layer of forests where forests actually fit in this picture. And then you ask yourself about where your talent lies or when, where your interests are. I'm sure there are so many different routes that you can undertake here and combine those things together. And I think we can all get there uh, through different routes, but the overall mission is that we are all working to promote environmentally appropriate, socially beneficial and economically viable management of the world's forests. And if you are in this webinar today, if you're listening to us, it means that you are already starting to get interested in this um, area and you are already in the right place. So a little bit about myself, just to tell you my own story and where I come from. I was born, I grew up in Poland in the 80s. Here you can see I was about maybe seven years old wearing a random hat and a jacket probably from some charity packs from Germany or Switzerland. But I was a very happy child and I was spending a lot of time outside and loving the nature, loving the outdoors. I was probably spending more time outside than inside than indoors. And I didn't really have a very much of a clue of what I wanted to do in the future. What I did know is that I really liked spending time outside and, and protecting the nature. Um, my family, um, in my family, my parents had studied economics. My grandparents were doctors, so they were not. Um, there were these were not careers that I would look up at. They were not. They did not seem very attractive to me. Uh, so when it came to the end of high school, and I had in front of myself some choices: what to do next, what university studies to undertake. I actually had three things on the table. And the one thing was that I loved books and literature and languages. I loved, uh, I already spoke several foreign languages by the end of the high school, and I wanted to study them more. Uh, I also loved art, and I, I did some, um, I, I did a lot of drawings and paintings, and I was considering a career in a school of fine arts to become an interior designer or something like that. And then, as I said, I also loved nature. So all in all, to make this story, long story short, I, I went for the first one and I studied um, French and Italian, which took me from my home city, from my University of Gdańsk to Rome and where I completed my studies and also studied international relations afterwards as a second, uh, second degree. So after completing my studies, I really needed a job. And one of the things I thought would really resonate with me, the work that I was uh, interested in was the work of the Food and Agriculture Organization. So I applied there, uh, but then as you may know, these things take a lot of time and many different tests, exams, interviews. So, I needed a job and the first thing I did after I graduated, I'd look for a job in Rome and I, I, I worked for a while as a booking manager in a very posh restaurant in, in Rome. But luckily then I got a call from FAO and I started there. 
So even after two years of working in FAO, I was still getting lost in the labyrinth of, of this big building, uh, but I really enjoyed it. And after two years, I saw a vacancy that was actually related to forests and forest genetic resources. And I honestly didn't have a clue what forest genetic resources were, but I know I knew that I was interested in forests. And that was a job at Biodiversity International, which is was one of the CGIR centers. And um, what I really loved about that was that I was part of great teams and I could move around the institutions. I worked in different roles around Biodiversity. And this is where I spent in this building in Makareza, I spent 11 years of my life because uh, we didn't work from home at the time. So this is the place where I spent a, a big chunk of my career. And this is also where I figured that what I really liked doing was communicating about research, about very complex scientific findings and making them attractive and uh, accessible to a wide audience. And as you may also know, communications is not a homogeneous area. So what I really liked there was to tell stories about this research. So that took me in several places around the world. Here I was in India making a documentary about the role of gender in non-timber forest products and bringing women closer to the markets, improving their livelihoods. And here I was in Zambia making a film about how people could actually um, use the surrounding biodiversity, agricultural biodiversity, to have a complete diet uh, when the fish stocks were depleting. And then I made this film about forests in Iceland, which got picked up by National Geographic. And that was also the moment when I thought, okay, this is really now becoming clear that also other people are appreciating what I'm doing. Um, this film has, I think over, by now it has over 4 million views. So that made me think, this is the right thing that you are doing. Just keep doing what you're doing, keep improving what you're doing uh, and, and just enjoy, because this is also something that I really enjoyed doing. Uh, here is another one a cover of another short documentary about uh, pine, uh, Pinus nigra in Lesbos Island and the story behind that population of pines in Greece. So when I think about it now, going back to the interests that I had in my head and the dilemmas that I was facing when I was at the end of the high school, I think that international environment languages, art, and environmental protection all come together in this career. I can do all of them uh, at the same time uh, in a very new and unexpected combination. So this is my latest project. I'm working on something that is related to log gates in Amsterdam that are built from tropical timber coming from the Congo Basin in Africa and explaining how on the one hand, we need wood and we need uh, we need tropical wood as well in Europe. Uh, Amsterdam stays dry below the sea level, uh, two meters below the sea level, thanks to the lock gates and the canals. And on the other hand, this timber that we have agreed to deforestation just the opposite, it can actually prevent deforestation because it contributes to people's livelihoods and prevents the land from becoming agricultural land. So this is a project that I have in the pipeline. And just to close a few messages for you who may be at the beginning of your careers and thinking, ah, oh, what should I do? What should I not do? Um, when I reflect, when I look back at those almost 20 years of my own experience, I think that what you really need to do is to listen to your heart and to nurture your talent, understand yourself, because this is 
something that will then fruit and you will enjoy doing what you're doing and you will do what you're good at. Um, at the same time, you can do what you like doing in a forest related organization. So there are so many openings for you. We need leaders, we need managers, we need creative people, we need technical experts. We need everyone to join this common mission to work together towards this common goal. And last but not least, I think what I achieved so far is also thanks to the colleagues that have worked with me. So really value your, your team and you can only achieve great things if you work in a team. So I really appreciate all people that I met along this pathway. And somehow I am what I am today because I have met all of them and they have also been great uh, addition and contribu contributed greatly to my own career. So I will stop here and um, I welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Eva. Thank you for this inspiring talk. Um, it was very, very interesting to see how you ended up uh, where you are at the moment and how, yeah, how many chances and, and opportunities there were in your life and all related to the forest sector. So thank you so much. We will come to a question and answer session later. So. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, please um, remember them until our Q&A session. Um, yeah, and uh, I would directly go uh, to our next speaker. Her name is Silvia. Uh, welcome, Silvia. And I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. Yes, uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I do not have a slide to share, but I have uh, uh, my story that I hope uh, will uh, will interest you. So um, I started to work for the wood industry in 2006 after having completed a master degree in European law. And what is similar uh, of the story with Eva is that I also uh, came into the wood industry, let's say by accident, because before the master in European law, actually my specialization was uh, um, in relation between the church and the state. And then uh, what happened after this uh, master degree in European law, I got the uh, opportunity to move uh, to Brussels. So I do not have any work in uh, uh, forestry or wood related uh, background. And since I arrived in uh, Brussels in uh, 2006, my job has been uh, uh, to analyze the impact of the EU legislation in the wood industry perspective, try to understand the trade-off, but also to advocate for new policy that can boost the competitiveness of the wood industry and also create or possibly maintain a new job. So when I started in 2006, I was working for a lobby organization called the Federlegno Arredo, who is the Italian Federation of the Woodworking and Furniture Industry. At that time, uh, I was uh, let's say, uh, overlooking at the EU policy uh, in general. But then I moved to work for EPF, the European Wood-Based Panel Federation, where I was more uh, responsible for environmental and research topic. And then currently I'm the Joint Secretary General for both EOS, European Organization of the Sawmill Industry, and CEBOA, the European Confederation of the Woodworking Industry. We are a small team here in Brussels. We are in total five people and a technical expert. And uh, we try to cover all of the uh, legislation that try to that may affect uh, our, our business. And if you are a little bit familiar with the uh, European contest, you may know that more than 80% of the legislation that actually happen at your member states level is actually a translation uh, of, um, of what is uh, discussed uh, here in Brussels. And this is uh, probably um, the first uh, things uh, that I would like to, uh, to underline. Since I started uh, to work for, uh, for the wood industry, what we have noticed is that uh, the amount of legislation that, uh, um, that has been produced at the Brussels level has been almost replicated. And if I can share you a slide, let's see if you can see it. 
So this is uh, the forest policy environment that uh, we are uh, uh, facing right now. So as you can see here at uh, my uh, right side in light green, you have all of the legislation come, let's say, at the international level. But on the left side, you can really see all the legislation that actually are discussed here in Brussels, uh, and they may affect directly or indirectly uh, our sector. You may know that uh, when we are discussing about uh, forest, uh, um, um, forestry, the competence is on member states. But when we are discussing, at least at Brussels level, about uh, forest, uh, uh, about environment, then uh, the European Commission share this competence with member states. And in this slide that actually I borrow by EFI, in this slide you can see all the legislation that has been produced by the European Commission. Some of them um, are already in a, in a second phase, like the timber regulation that for, it won't uh, exist anymore, is going to be replaced by the UDR, another new mechanism that will affect how uh, timber is, um, is sold on the market. Or, for example, the new proposal of the Commission on uh, Carbon Certification, there will be an impact uh, again at forestry level. And last but not least, uh, uh, the very recent, uh, um, the very recent uh, uh, legislation proposed by the Commission on the um, on a forest monitoring system. So this is in a, in a nutshell uh, what we are facing every day as a lobby uh, of lobby organization, and uh, um, what is essential in our uh, in our current job is always uh, to coordinate also with other Brussels-based organization. As I said, I'm working for Cebois and uh, in AOS, but there are other sectoral organization here in Brussels, like CPF, Eustafor, they represent the forest owner, CEPI, they represent the pulp and paper, Copacujeca represent the agriculture and forestry, or Aebium, uh, the bioenergy Europe that represent uh, uh, the bioenergy sector. And every time that a proposal uh, is put forward uh, uh, by the commission, then what we try to do, it's really to analyze all together, starting from our sector, then try to analyze it all together in order to see what it could be the impact uh, for a subsector of the uh, of the forestry value value chain. And it is uh, it is a quite a challenge and uh, and demanding and demanding job. As sector, we also face another important challenge. Brussels is probably one of the most complicated uh, um, lobby environment. And why this? Not only we are confronted uh, with the uh, 27 member states. We are also confronted with a parliament that change all the, every five years. And then we are also confronted with presidency that can that change every six months. The most difficult part for our sector is to make the new parliament every time is elected aware about who we are. As I said at the very beginning, when I joined, when I joined this, uh, um, my first, uh, my first employer. So when I joined Federlenio Arredo, I didn't know about this op op opportunity. I didn't know that there was a, a woodworking industry that it should have been defended. And this is also the reality with the, uh, what we are confronted every time there is a new parliament in place. Many members of the parliament they do not know the forestry reality. Sometimes they know a little bit about uh, forest. Sometimes they know a little bit about the wood industry. But I have to say that is a rare uh, to find MEP that they really have uh, this uh, comprehensive understanding about, uh, um, about our value chain. So we need to make understanding very clearly that the woodworking industry is uh, part, an integrated part of the sustainable forest management. This is one aspect of our communication uh, that we need always and always uh, to, to work with because it's the aspect that is less uh, well known. Um, this, is, uh, this is in a nutshell uh, um, what I do. And uh, what is the peculiarity of my job? And at the same time is also what I love the most about this, of this job is the fact that uh, 
it's a continuous learning process and the human relationship are really very strong. Uh, also, Eva highlighted that, that uh, uh, the importance of a team and probably this is one of the aspects that I would like to emphasize the most because when you work for uh, uh, the woodworking industry, you are really working for family business uh, uh, companies and this human relation is very, is very powerful. At the same time, when you work with the people here in Brussels, you, you start to know this community very well and you spend a lot of time with them. So it's a really building a kind of a, a understanding of our sector for the others in a positive environment. But as I said, it's also a learning process because every time uh, there is something new that you have to learn, our industry is a mature industry, but that nevertheless does not imply that there is not a new research and development ongoing. There are constantly market analysis. And this is something very important that also our organization is carrying on and uh, um, also trying to link a new innovation in our narrative is also quite, uh, uh, quite important. Innovation that it could be in, uh, inside the industry, but also innovation at the forestry level when it comes, for example, about uh, uh, the bark beetles. This is something that we have been uh, confronted in the past years. So the propagation of the bark beetle at forestry level he had a big impact on our, uh, um, on our business. So we had to understand how the two things were actually matching together, how the development of the bark beetle uh, will project in the future, how our industry can respond. So it's always, uh, as I said, uh, um, topic after topic to, to be developed. So this is, um, in a nutshell, my experience. <laughs> So much there, yeah. This was there are so many aspects I never thought about when when thinking about the woodworking industry. So thank you very much for sharing this. I think there are many many aspects of novelty, and it's so complex. I mean, there are so many aspects. You you mentioned the communication, the lobbyism, the laws changing all the time. So yeah, there's really really many um, opportunities, but challenges. I can imagine. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing. And uh, last but not least, from our three biographies today, I'm happy to hand over to Lyuba directly. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Vera. Let me share my presentation with you. So thank you very much, um, Eva and uh, Silvia, for these very fascinating stories and inspiring stories of how completely different fields also can end up in forestry. And I want to share with you a bit the other way around, kind of my background is more actually in the traditional area of forestry, but I ended up working currently in a um, field that I would definitely describe as, as novel. My name is Leo Barra. I'm from Germany and I emigrated to Switzerland to study environmental sciences without any um, real real idea of ending up in forestry at all. Um, and I would like to tell you today a bit about um, what is novel about working at a state forest enterprise. Very sounds very traditional at first. And um, how this, what I do, digital development can end up in this very traditional field. Like Eva, I like to spend a lot of time outside uh, in my in my free time. So I kind of ended up in forestry in the beginning by accident because they simply had the best um, field courses, field trips. And um, that's how I kind of got into it. But I want to share with you a bit what how I came to really love this field. And um, like both of my other panelists have said before, the people in this field. When um, I think of the traditional forester, especially here in Switzerland, it's mostly people like this. It's these, these very skilled men with big, sturdy hiking boots and um, chainsaws and large machines that run up and down the mountains cutting trees. And um, even though I've done a tree felling course as well, and it's been one of the most exciting things that I've done, um, I'm definitely not that person. Um, but what I did learn is that I really am fascinated by this incredibly diverse environment that we already saw today as well that these people work in. 
forestry, we're working in a very complex environment um, that has aspects of all kinds of topics. Um, we're working in a in a in an environment that is not very uh, easily influenced. It is influenced by large scale and small scale um, factors. So we are working really with just what nature gives us, which gives a very interesting um, interesting aspect to this work. At the same time, we're navigating a field which is highly influenced by emotion of all kinds of humans were um, navigating this field that is changing. It's also been set away from the traditional just wood provided provision, but towards provision of health and recreation and um, well-being cultural services. So that gives a completely different aspect to this new field that we are, I am experiencing every day. Um, at the same time, I'm confronted every day with these these big topics that forestry is in that we're working with sustainability we're working to fulfill the sustainable development goals every day outside when we're trying to to manage our forests uh, we're working to provide building material right heating essential things for for human human existence which is also why the emotions are involved that much and um Mainly what Silvia has said in the end now very nicely, we're really working with small and, and medium-sized business owners, family businesses. And that brings, especially here in Switzerland, where we also have the, the, the difficult terrain, sometimes it brings up incredible characters. And working with these um, characters that have to navigate this whole field um, and have to have an incredible skill set to work in nowadays forestry, um, that's where I found my niche in working in forestry. Three years ago, I joined a research team that mainly works with small forest management comp companies on efficiency, uh, among other things. And through a thesis, I kind of got into the field of digital support for these companies. So these companies need to manage a forest. They need to manage the people in it. They need to manage big expectations in it. And then they need to run a business. So what we were working on is supporting them on a digital level with their infrastructure, with their IT um, to make their life easier. And um, until one year ago, I joined the state forestry enterprise of the Canton of Bern, uh, which is the largest forest owner in Switzerland here, which is still compar comparatively small to some other European businesses. Um, but uh, in this company, we are large enough that they have created a very special position here. And here, my uh, job is really that support, that digital support of my coworkers um, to facilitate also the, the, their everyday lives in managing the forest that we, that we own and in also developing our company on a digital level, level transitioning it into a more modern, efficient future. So this job and this position brings me in a quite interesting um, position and in, quite unique position in the, in the forestry level, that um, forestry environment that is still very traditional in this um, also rural agricultural area that we are working in. Um, it brings me in contact with all kinds of different levels. So I'm working with our apprentices in the company who need to, for example, they are uh, measuring wood, like in the background on the picture, uh, they're measuring it to sell it to the wood processing industry, and they need to do this on a digital um, device. They need to type in the data, need, need to measure it, put in the quality so we can give it on to pass it on to our customers. That's a digital process. So I need to educate the from apprentices to everyone um, to use these digital tools that we have for measuring wood, for example. On the other hand, I'm working with the CEOs of our companies to develop strategies on the long-term development. Where do we want to be in 10 years? How does digitalization play a role in it? How do we manage to eliminate um, paper that is unnecessary in our company? How do we create all the databases in our company in 10, 15 years? So we're really working on very day-to-day -day, um, topics also on the long-term development um on sorry that way around 
on a next level, I'm really working from small uh, problems that arise in the moment, like um, a broken printer, <laughs> or when it comes to IT, that's also part of it. And I think everyone has, um, everyone working in an office has faced this at one point or the other. And having this position in the forestry sector sounds counterintuitive, but it's so essential to being able to facilitate the work of the people who actually manage our future future environments out there to make their life a bit easier by fixing their printer and um, so they can go on and fix our environment. But I'm also working on the on the high level strategic um, decisions. Do we want to change our processes to be more digital? Whom do we want to include? What does that mean on the technical background? Um, another aspect of my of my work when it comes to digital um, development in a forestry company, it ranges from the very start of um, the forestry life, from planting a new tree, from founding a new forest, to the end of the, the end, no, it's the start of a new life cycle, when we um, cut the trees and give them over to the, the timber uh, industry. So in the beginning, the foresters that I work with, my coworkers, they need to know data about where they can plant the trees, what trees they can plant, what soil is there. They need to have um, uh, it, data about the vegetation. They need to have data about the precipitation, climate data, all these kind of digital information um, that takes a lot away from their resource if they have to think about it. So they have a facilitator, which is my role, to help them um, get all the information necessary. And then until the whole um, chain, until we have the, the, the product on the, on the forest road and we need to bring it to the sawmills, then the digital part comes again with logistics. What kind of wood do we have? Where is it? Where do we want to bring it? All this is digital information. How is that available? Um, how do we uh, make it available to our customers? How do we, we make it available to our own workers? This is a very technical, but also um, strategic idea. How do we want to make it and what is actually possible? And this is also what I've, I'm working with every, every day, every week. And then the, the last field is um, very much uh, from the digitalization of the individual trees back to more traditional forestry. Um, you might have heard one big word currently in forestry is the digital twin of the forest, which um, aims to make a complete copy of our forests, our trees to get all the data we can have measuring anything we can have with all the different um, instruments that are available now, which is a very fastly developing field as well. It's highly technical. Um, it's about sensors and um, laser scanning and uh, robots in the forest, but it's also about how to manage this data and what is actually useful in the end. And then another aspect of all this um, digital infrastructure of just data and, and measuring and facilitating is simply also the hardware that comes part of it. That is also part of my job. And I can give you an example of what I'm doing as well. We recently moved our office and my job was among other things to just make sure that everyone has their right infrastructure, laptops, computers, um, network, Wi-Fi. So I'm, I'm going the whole circle from the planting of the new tree over the people facilitating them and helping them to be able to use the tools we have, to providing them with the right data we have, to providing them with the hardware um, they need to work. It is uh, start very deeply rooted in the in the forestry sector, but it has a whole range of different um, aspects that go very much into the future of this field of forestry, I believe. And that is a very rewarding, if not very challenging job. But I've been working for one year now in this company, and I think there hasn't been one week where I didn't learn anything new. And I'm looking forward to continue that. So I can just continue uh, saying what Sylvia and um, Eva have said before. The people are the thing that holds this 
together and it doesn't really matter if you're working with a man in the hiking boots or if you're working with a with a man in the parliament um or the woman in the parliament what there is a spot for everyone in forestry and this field needs also everyone with all their skills available and that has been motivating me and i hope it, i could also motivate some of you guys to show you what is possible Well, that is really a, a clash of worlds you described here. And uh, yeah, it really goes from the traditional to the to the novel world, as you phrased it, with it, all the digitalization. But I find it very interesting how we always come back to, to the human aspect in the end and how important it is with, with whom you work together. So thank you so much for sharing. And we had now uh, three very different, very interesting people who are already working in the field, some for a longer time, some for shorter time. But of course, we are also interested to learn about the youth perspective. So I'm very happy to announce our next speaker, Isabel. She is the current president of the International Forestry Students Association. And um, welcome, Isabel. I'm very interested um, to, to learn about the aspects of novel green forest jobs in your studies, what is addressed, what is maybe missing. And um, how do you see novel green forest jobs um, addressing the challenges of maybe the lack of interest of young people entering the sector? The floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you, Vera, and thank you everyone for attending our webinar. I am very honored to be part of an all-female panel who come from different um, industries in the forest-related sectors and with different experiences. So before I jump into the perspective of the youth, I would just like to share a few of my experiences. So this is me at 18 years old, experiencing my first on-ground um, forest activities. Um, but unfortunately, the number of um, field work that I had done in my undergrad, it was not enough for me to be able to fully develop my skills now as a forestry professional. Um, I had, uh, during COVID times, um, the classes were fully online, so that really did not improve the skills and knowledge that I wanted to have by the end of my study. And when classes came back um, this year, I had an internship, but again, the internship did not really immerse me in, and prepare me for what I was going to do now that I, ha I am working in the forestry sector. But during my second year of undergraduate studies, I joined IFSA, which is the International Forestry Students Association. And it gave me a very diverse experience when it comes to um, having on-ground and first-hand um, perspective on forestry practices in the places that we've visited, I became um, a part of the panel of important discussions, including now at COP28 here in Dubai. And I am also part of um, the decision-making of an international organization as uh, the president of IFSA. And now that I am four months in into my um, working life, I now work at C4 ECRAF as the communication associate under the uh, Sustainable Farming and Tropical Asian Landscapes Project, which works for the sustainable development of cacao in the Philippines and oil palm in Indonesia. And um, on top of the things that I have learned in my undergraduate studies, I feel like IFSA has really um, contributed a lot to the skills and knowledge that I have now. And it made me feel even more prepared to further pursue my career in the forestry sector. And now I, I am going to give my uh, the youth perspective on what is lacking from the um, university curriculums when it comes to forestry related programs, and as well what needs to be done in order to fill these gaps. So IFSA is the International uh, Association of uh, students from forestry and related fields. We're one of the largest networks of students from these fields, and it was established in 1990. We envision the world to appreciate forests, and 
we do this by enriching our members' education, by immersing themselves in international events, in intercultural exchange, and networking opportunities. So we are a worldwide network of students and young researchers. We provide education to forestry students and connect them to other members around the world. And the forestry sector provides livelihood to 33 million people worldwide, which is only 1% of the global workforce. In recent years, there has been a drastic decline of employment in the forestry sector, which has mostly affected forest industries in the Americas and Asia because, to the increase, uh, because of the increased levels of mechanization and labor productivity gains. On top of that, only less than a quarter of employees in, in the sector are women, making them significantly underrepresented in the forestry sector. And on top of that, the workforce in the forestry sector is aging and not growing fast enough. It was actually found in a study found, uh, conducted by Forest Europe that there is a labor shortage in the European forest sector because workers aged uh, 50 years old and above will leave the sector within the next 10 to 20 years. But how can we address this issue if youth per participation in the forestry sector is also decreasing? The Food and Agriculture Organization in 2013 reported that young people are no longer engaging in forest-related work in most countries because of low profitability, harsh working conditions, and physically demanding skills. Even countries like Germany and Estonia were found to have a significant, a significant drop in technical level um, graduations in forest-related education. Because of this, young people lack the motivation to continue pursuing a career in forestry because we do not have adequate access to capacity building opportunities to develop our skills, which would make us more qualified for high skilled positions. And this is especially true for young people in rural areas. So what is IFSA doing to address this uh, issue? So first we become the bridge to internships and traineeships. And as you can see here on the slide, um, we provide internships uh, together with our partners from IUFRO, EFI, FAO. And just recently, we signed a memorandum of agreement with the Australian Forest Products Association. And one of our plans is very much related to providing job opportunities to students, especially in uh, Australia. The second thing that IFSA is doing is to provide capacity building and networking opportunities. And um, we do the, these through activities such as capacity building workshops, which teach our members to develop their soft skills, such as writing a curriculum vitae or how to create a resume, as well as webinar series to teach them about the current situations in specific areas in forestry. And um, this is one of the projects that I have uh, conducted during my service in IFSA, which is the job fair. Uh, this year, we were able to invite 12 organizations from all over the world, both international and regional, to pitch about their organization's mission, activities, and also about the job or internship, internship opportunities that they are offering. And uh, it started in 2022, but every year we, we um, consistently get 200, more than 200 um, um, participants from all over the world, which means that there is a high interest from our members and other forestry students to actually get employment uh, in forest-related sectors. And lastly, we have our projects and initiatives. First, um, one of our major projects in IFSA is the IFSA Tree Learning, which is an e-learning platform that um, that teaches its users um, about soft skills and also forestry topics. Uh, currently, we have more than five modules on the website. And if you want to see the modules that we have up there, you can visit our website, which I will show a QR code to you later. And the second uh, major project that we have in IFSA is the Gender Open Letter. So this is a collaborative work of IFSA members to make forest education more inclusive. So the Open Letter contains four demands and a call for change 
to strengthen FINTA or female, intersex, non-binary, trans, and agender within forestry science and practices. So the four demands specifically are counteracting structural discrimination through establishing courses on gender awareness, implement a gender-aware learning environment, introduce and highlight role models for FINTA students, and increasing existing knowledge and networks. So this open letter was sent to forestry universities and departments, organizations, policymakers, so that our demands on this topic can be heard. And if you want to read and watch the gender open letter here, you can scan the QR code. And we have two upcoming projects in IFSA. The first is a collaboration with the forest, a school forest project, uh, where we will integrate the tree learning platform to improve the learning of secondary school students uh, when it comes to forestry related topics. So the pilot project will be conducted in May next year. And um, the second project, which, which is the gender um, massive open online course, which, which is a joint effort by experts on gender equality, diversity and inclusion in forest related sectors. And this initiative was created as a part of the Task Force on Gender Equality and Forestry within IUFRO, which will reduce the education gap, make the latest research and best practices in forest-related sectors easily available to everyone. Now, to answer the question, how can novel green jobs address the youth's lack of interest in forestry? Once we provide the youth um, capacity building to develop their skills and knowledge, so that they're um, fully prepared to pursue a career in forestry. And uh, they, they will be able to have access to no novel green jobs that, have, that will grant them improved health and safety, flexible working time, fairer wages, a gender balanced workplace, and as well as vital role in environmental conservation and restoration. And now to summarize my presentation, um, I think my takeaway is to invest in youth and women for the future of forest and society. And this comes, this is derived from the words of the FAO Director General Ku Dong Yu, uh, where he said, investing in a sustainable future means investing in youth. And from my perspective, we can only have a well-trained, highly skilled, and highly motivated workforce that is capable of coping with challenges in the forestry sector if we invest in the education and career development of the younger generation, highlight their contributions and expertise, and provide equitable opportunities for the youth to become the next leaders in the forestry sector. And again, if you want to visit our website and see the open letter, the tree learning, and, and our other initiatives, you can scan this QR code or visit the link written there. So thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Isabel. Thank you for, for sharing your reality with us and also all the tremendous work IFSA is doing to encourage the youth. Uh, I think we can be all very fortunate that IFSA exists and have such motivated young people uh, networking, being active and uh, yeah, really also raising the voice of the young people. Um, I really like the idea of already going into schools when it comes uh, to the forestry sector uh, topic. So yeah. I'm curious to, to, to learn what's going on in May. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, thanks to all the five presentations, uh, we will come now to our um, discussion around. And uh, I would uh, like to address directly to Isabel the first question. Um, because we talked a lot about uh, jobs now and also novel jobs. And I would be curious if you know someone who has ventured into entrepreneurship after their studies. So they founded maybe an own company or a startup or anything like this, or if you even could consider this uh, yourself at one point. So thank you for that question. Actually, I've been pondering a lot about this question when I first, uh, um, and then before I didn't know any entrepreneurs uh, related to the forest sector, but now that I went to COP28 here in Dubai, I met a lot of entrepreneurs that work for forestry and even other sectors. Uh, they come from all over the world, such as Australia, Spain, Philippines, Madagascar, 
And when I asked them why did they choose to uh, pursue entrepreneurship instead of having uh, a job in the forestry sector, it's because they want to have uh, more impact on the ground um, in their respective communities and internationally, which they feel like they will not uh, be able to accomplish if they work um, for an international um, organization. And um, actually in COP, there is a community of entrepreneurs and they are all advocated to, uh, they're all advocating to um, increase the capacity building of young people, not only um, students that are pursuing forestry, but in other sectors as well, um, so that young people can increase their interest towards entrepreneurship. So my idea is to actually increase their interest is to um, integrate entrepreneurship modules or lessons into the curriculum of universities, um, which is something that I did not learn um, a few years ago when I was in my undergraduate, and to um, join communities with other entrepreneurs to enable knowledge exchange um, between them and also for them to have a network with other entrepreneurs that are of much older age. And the third thing is to give young people and women the on-ground experiences because this is what they actually want, uh, to give them the platform to have impact in their own communities. And lastly, in order for them to be able to start their, um, their companies or their businesses is to make funding and other resources available for them so that they can actually accomplish the impact that they want, both local, regional, or um, international level. That's very interesting. It's great that you have hands-on experience at the moment uh, at the COP, so if you'd like. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Isabel, for being here with us today. Uh, my next question would go to Lioba, um, working in this forestry IT world, digitalization. Um, how is the field of forestry transitioning into a more modern future? And where might maybe conflicts arise um, when you think about also the traditional sector? Yeah, well, the um, first thing that I can say about that is my very, very field of work digitalization. I think we all are living in an already very digital world. But my experience is that forestry is a bit behind when it comes to that on a lot of levels. So digitalization poses quite the big new new challenge. We have so much more availability of data, of instruments to gather data, of instruments to work together, of instruments how that change our very everyday life. We are on a webinar. We are not in a seminar room. Um, so this is a quite a big difference in how we work together. And it's not always easy to bring that to a forestry field, which is um, traditionally out there uh, with a chainsaw. Um, so that, that can be challenging. And the second thing that I would say how the, the field is, challenge, uh, is changing is by encompassing more expectations and diverse, ex diverse expectations and involvement from the public. We have more and more, uh, especially in densely populated areas like Central Europe, we have more and more people wanting to contribute to forestry, having ideas on how it should be done, how it um, is best for all diverse interests that we also see in the wide variety of also new forest green, um, green forest jobs. And encompassing all these, um, while a technological uh, new digitalization revolution is going on is quite the challenge can be a bit much. So um, they're especially making space and, and creating creating skills in, to manage all this diverse field of communication, people's expectations, also traditional forest management, sustainability while being in a digitalization process um, is, is a challenge that all small, medium companies are, are working on quite a lot currently. Um, and um, yeah, a lot of more skills and education will have to be put into that um, in, the, in the future too. 
changes can also be scary and then all this digitalization goes so quickly <laughs> but yeah thanks thanks a lot for sharing um Sylvia we touched a little bit already on the the gender um, issues and heard that there are only very few women uh, working in in forestry um when you look at the um the job opportunities you have um, regarding the novel green forest jobs with the um, woodworking industry. Do you have any examples of maybe interesting jobs, especially for women? Yes, so but first of all, we need to say that uh, for what it concerns, the presence of women in our industry, we do not have a precise st statistic. So this is already a quite a, a challenge because we cannot really engage as company in possible growth. Uh, because we do not have a baseline scenario and like this we are not really able to monitor if our actions are actually leading to, to concrete uh, uh, results. Um, moreover, our sector is also facing challenge because uh, um, women are not particularly attracted as they fear that uh, uh, this is a man job. But nevertheless, due to the technology innovation of our company, even the most fragile person could perfectly work in the timber industry. And the companies now also offer flexible working hours in order to retain talent by allowing male and female employees flexible working condition to accommodate the family needs. Another aspect that I think is quite interesting is that uh, now a bigger company offer also opportunity in uh, working areas as a new product development. We have company who have uh, inside the research uh, department or IT department. Uh, as I said before, we have many policy ongoing at the Brussels level and aspects uh, related to circularity, traceability, sustainability, we, sure, we are sure that they will also open a new working opportunity uh, for, the, for female in, uh, in the wood uh, industry. And we are a society who move very fast, uh, where the communication has, has to be really attractive, uh, must uh, um, quickly inform a consumer. So another area where we see a key role uh, for the young generation uh, and being equally attractive also for uh, uh, male and female is uh, all uh, um, the, the area related to, to communication. But as I said at the beginning, we do not have precise statistics about uh, women involved in the wood industry. Uh, we have some uh, uh, information that there are not many. And this is why uh, as the organization, both the CEBOA and AOS, together with other industry partners and in collaboration with the trade union, have recently launched a project called the Resilient Wood. And through this project, among the different areas that we are going to investigate, there is indeed the gender balance in order to understand how our industry can attract more female, what is the role of digitalization in attracting more female, in our industry. And we are also planning to have a seminar uh, at the end of March, 27 March, in order to share some uh, um, information um, from the company themselves uh, and also to, to discuss uh, with, uh, uh, with other research center in order to analyze what it could be um, possible uh, development and then define a policy recommendation for, uh, for the policymaker. Then, last but not least, we cannot forget that uh, uh, indirectly female can also be very much attracted by our sector and get engaged in our sector through job like architect or engineer. Uh, for this kind of activities where uh, the architect or engineer want to use sustainable material as wood is, then we see the possibility for, uh, for female really to, to be uh, involved indirectly but nevertheless in an important part of our, uh, of our job. So these are in a nutshell uh, the, the key area of, uh, of the future for female in the wood industry. Thank you, Sylvia. It's really interesting also to, to where to draw the line when the forest world stops and where does architecture start? So mm -hmm. yeah, thanks a lot for sharing. And it's great to see that um, also the topic of, of gender and female inclusion is so present and I'm yeah, I hope I can join the, the webinar in, in March. That sounds very interesting. Thank you so much for sharing.
Um, Eva, you work in the communication area. Uh, how relevant or crucial would you say your job is um, solving the current crisis and challenging the world is facing when we think about all the demands on forests? So we want all the services um, on forests, we want to protect it, we want to um, use sustainable harvested wood, but please don't cut it down because it looks ugly. <laughs> so um, how would you describe your role as a communication officer here? Thank you, Vera. Indeed, it's a very interesting question. And I think it's the challenge of my life to actually bridge those two things together in communications. And that is bringing the value of using wood sustainably and using it well, because we all need it, but also preserving the forests. Uh, I think it was Lioba who mentioned there are a lot of emotions uh, when it comes to forest people chaining themselves to trees. And this is something that we observe, at, for example, uh, in media coverage, um, what is very often coming up in our uh, analysis of media is that topics that are very often picked up by media is when it comes to preserving mother nature and uh, people protecting the forest and it's a wild place and this is something that resonates with a lot of people so bringing this element of use of wood is a very a, a very difficult thing when it comes to general public and media because it's not people don't like uh, seeing trees being cut down uh, they they like to see them protected and yet we, people who chain themselves to trees are also the ones who will who will use toilet paper every day and maybe they are not thinking that they need to cut trees to use that toilet paper so we need both so in my all my efforts of communications i'm trying to bridge those two narratives and bring them together and show that we can do both at the same time to have an integrated forest management where we have a thriving forest and we also have products that come from this forest. And I'm trying to do that through compelling stories and to have those stories um, uh, published in top tier media so that many, as many people as possible can see them and relate to them so that we build strongly this narrative that nature is on not only mother nature to protect but it's also nature that of which we human beings are part and um, this is the thing that is related strictly to my job but already at FSC uh, as a mission we are bridging those two dimensions together so we work both with forest managers and we work with businesses who want to show that they are sustainable and that they source sustainable materials from the forest. And FSC is also a chamber-based uh, system. So we have uh, members that come from the social, environmental and economic uh, organizations and they take decisions all together. So this is also where these different dimensions come together and uh, in the end result in a solution that bridges the needs of all those different actors and as we see it is possible in the communication yeah thank you eva for this question goes to ilaria and i also saw that there's a question in the chat to you so i think you can stay unmuted <laughs> but uh, my question to you ilaria would be so you presented the report um at the beginning with all the statistics and i would be interested in what are the next steps here and um the report will be published on on the forest europe website soon but once it's out there why should i read it yeah uh, thank you vera uh, yeah i didn't I didn't saw the question, so now I'm also reading the question. Um, yeah, so we, um, as you, uh, as you said, we are, um, yeah, analyzing and drafting this report that will have this, um, the the output of the survey and uh, uh, and the workshop. Uh, we are also doing uh, actually a, a round of feedback uh, internally. Uh, because as mentioned also by by Silvia uh, before, we don't have a lot of uh, data statistics on this uh, novel and new forest jobs. So we want to grasp in this 
product in this report as much information and also perspective um, as possible. So in, in early 2024, you will have it this um, this report that we uh, hope it, it it will be a first, let's say, building block. Uh, so a first block uh, on which to build, you know, future research, hopefully more systematic uh, research to give uh, evidence of this novel green forest jobs uh, and also uh, give evidence to the opportunities they represent, but also uh, the needs they have to, to thrive. We have uh, listened from uh, Isabel Lioba. Uh, there, are, there are many uh, needs out there. Uh, so we want also to give, uh, try to give evidence also to that. Um, also, why to why to read it? Uh, it's novel green forest job, so it's something new. We hope, uh, of course, is not uh, is not a complete overview. Is a glance, uh, let's say, on a emerging topic, uh, and um, I think we hope um, that on one side this will help advance the topic. Uh, also in the in the policy agenda, building evidence um, on new job and also in general to the huge contribution of uh, forest. So the contribution to our lives in terms of yeah services uh, and, and goods and benefits, but also in terms of jobs that are fair and decent. And for let's say the single person, I think. Um, I also hope um, this report will give you um, new food for thoughts, uh, also the possibility to maybe yeah, uh, discover new interesting jobs, uh, but also to understand that maybe your job is a novel emerging job in the forestry uh, sector, and also to understand how wide the forestry sector is and also how welcoming, I would say, because also uh, yeah, I loved what what uh, Iwa was saying at the beginning. I mean, um, you can be creative in the forest uh, sector. Uh, so there is space really for a different um, uh, different and various talents uh, out there. So we we hope to, yeah, uh, just give give a, a small glance and to uh, to start a process uh, to discover on novel free green forest jobs. Yeah, thank you. It's probably the start of something new and exciting. <laughs> so, um, yeah, thank you, Laria. And um, I just read out the question from the chat. It's from Marion. And the question was, um, did you collect gender data in your survey? So different perspective concerns jobs from men and women. Mm -hmm. uh, is definitely a good question, but the answer is basically no, uh, because we, um, um, as mentioned, we have uh, just tried to to scratch a little bit, so we we were asking more broad questions about the about the jobs. Uh, so we don't have numbers, so we don't have exact numbers. Not always exact numbers on the number of jobs created in different countries. So we didn't even ask about that. But we uh, we have um, some questions about the perception about the opportunities. So we asked. Uh, our uh, respondents, how they felt, how they perceived these jobs were could be uh, opportunity for different uh, target groups. So we have this kind of vision, but not um, uh, not an in depth um, yeah vision on, on gender perspectives and so on. It's definitely something that we uh, yeah that there is the need to to look further in that. Okay, thank thank you so much. So on the chat that also Juliette sharing um, a report with a link, so you're all welcome to look at it, indicating that um, it also just inf influences the career choice of young people. So women tend to go more to conservation and um, and men more into the industry. Um, yeah, we are running out of time. Time is really flying today. So if you bear with me one or two more minutes, I would be very happy to have questions from the audience everybody. Um, Lucia was asking if you can write the question here. Um, I'm also happy to give you the floor, Lucia. I see you. Um, I think I need Santiago to unmute you. The floor is yours, Lucia. Yes, thank you. I had forgotten you. You did say indeed that we should just raise our hand. Um, yeah, thank you, everybody. Uh, this is Lucia from Berlin. 
and I wanted to share that I have been looking for a job in forestry um, for a while now, for several months, and all my applications have been unsuccessful uh, because I didn't study forestry. I studied um, natural resource management, and I thought that would be enough, you know, to get into forestry, but apparently it hasn't. Um, and I particularly applied for a job at FSC, for example, and in several other organizations. So I just wanted to, to maybe my question is really general. I just wanted to hear if you have like any advice of whether it is impossible to get into forestry. I'm really interested. I don't want to do communication work, but I want to do like really forestry work, like forest planning, forest management, and so on. So if there is something that I can do differently instead of just applying or like, do you recommend to really get a degree in forestry or would you say there's like some other organizations that I could look into? Yeah, that would be my question. Erin, um, I would ask the general floor if you have any advice. From my side, I can only say you have to be very stubborn for your first job. I can talk about myself. It also took me a long time to, to find my first job. I know this doesn't help, but <laughs> stubbornness helps. Um, but if so, you, maybe you unmuted yourself? Yes, I, I've heard this before and I kind of faced the same thing in the beginning of my, my, my career here in the state forest enterprise because my um, degree is in forestry but in environmental management forest management and i have real i have noticed that especially traditional forestry companies can be very um hesitant to employ people who don't have a forestry degree um because especially for the kind of work that you're looking for lucia the the forest management forest planning work um, they say you don't have the the, the on the ground um, experience. My advice or my my experience there is that try to find an internship with a company that that does on the ground work and start somewhere. Internships always help. I have colleagues here who come from completely different fields. I have a colleague um, who works who used to who has a degree in IT who is now um, also working as a forest planner. I have a colleague who has a degree in um, media creation, who is now a forester. And they took stepping stones as interns, really getting the, the, the tree experience of on the ground, try all kinds of companies. I think if you want to work as a, as a forest manager, um, experience in smaller companies who who manage forests on the ground are very valuable. Um, high level like FSC is also interesting and very valuable. But I think if you're going into the the management and planning area, try to be start from the bottom up internships and try to apply with companies on the ground. Sharing and yeah, all the best for you, Lucia. Um, looking at the time, I would like to ask if everybody is happy to open their camera for a moment so we can take a group picture. Um, I, uh, technical wise, if you don't want to be on our social media, please don't open. I would like to publish uh, the, the group picture um, along together with our recordings from today. Um, but yeah, otherwise I would be very happy to see some faces and not only talk to my, my dark screen, <laughs> and then to ask Santiago to, to all of us. Okay, I just, I'm just i just waiting also for if there is more people willing to. As I said, it's totally voluntary. Mm -hmm. um... Okay, so in one, two, three, wait, and now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Being here with us today, and thanks for yeah giving us a couple of more minutes of this, uh, I think, very interesting and very novel topic we have. Um, last thing for me today is to, to thank you all, to wish you a nice uh, Christmas time. I hope you will all uh, be healthy and happy in the new year. And um, yeah, I think it was very inspiring. 
And thank you a lot uh, to all our panelists today. Thanks again to Santiago for the technical support. And uh, I hope you keep um, keep an eye on our Forest Europe website for the reports and all the other activities we do regarding novel green forest jobs and of course all the work Forest Europe is doing. And um, yeah, I just wish you all the best and thanks a lot for being here with us today. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you, bye.